Well, I'm very honored to be here. Sounds like a cliche, but I really feel it. I mean, such uh, heart and mind and support. So I hope to explore with you, let's see here, moving forward and going backward, the real implications of this quotation from the Dhammapada. Think not lightly of good, saying it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one, gathering it little by little, fills oneself with good. So I'd like to explore with you uh, the practical implications of modern brain science for how as we go through our day, and as we help others go through their day, we can gather little moments, authentic, genuine little moments, and help them leave lasting beneficial residues behind, hardwired into the fabric of our own nervous system. Okay, so here we go. Um, the real question is, what's the relationship between resilience and well-being? And I'm a methods guy. I don't think I'm one of the world's leading authorities on the brain. I'm in the trenches. I'm practical. I'm a clinical psychologist, a mindfulness teacher, uh, and also a parent, a husband. I've been in business. Um, so I'm really interested in kind of what works. And what has struck me, as someone who's been involved in human potential, I started meditating in 1974. And before that, I was doing wild and crazy things as well. Um, over that long run, very often these positive psychology practices, which have a long tradition, uh, 100 years plus easily, especially if you think back to Jung and Maslow and humanistic psychology and things like that, um, sometimes these practices are inadvertently presented as sort of like magic carpets. Just do this gratitude thing. Just do this loving kindness practice. Just remember your grandmother's kitchen. All of it's good. But it's like a magic carpet ride, suddenly you're over here in bliss world. But what about coping? What about dealing with crud? Uh, if we don't have uh, fundamental resilience, fundamental capacity to adapt to changing conditions and keep on going, even when it's hard for our own sake and that uh, for the sake of others as well, if we don't have that core of resilience, we can't sustain well-being. So I want to explore with you here the intersection of the two and how, as we'll see in a wonderful upward spiral, you can use moments of well-being or aspects of it to grow resilience, which then can help you become, uh, have even more well-being. So resilience, as I said, is about more than just surviving the worst day of your life. It's very important for that. And um, it's also about thriving every day of your life, dealing with stresses, dealing with being stuck in a car for four hours on your way to a workshop, uh, rushing about. Uh, I was talking with somebody who was looking uh, for some audiovisual support a little bit earlier here. And how do we manage those kinds of waves? Or quarrels with, uh, uh, in our family, you know, what do you do when you're sitting across the table from your teenager and you get, they give you that look, you know, the look. <laughs> right? <laughs> Right, as Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, the philosopher said, I think, hell is other people. So <laughs> we need resilience, right? We need resilience for that stuff as well. OK. So and as you probably noticed, the world is changing. It seems to be changing even more rapidly. I'm from America. And holy moly, looking at that heart-mind flower almost with the five attributes and thinking of some political leaders and thinking, man, it would be so much better if they had even one of those flowers. <laughs> one, let alone two or five. All right, so I'm going to keep going. So, OK. So remarkably, as you'll see, internalizing experiences of ordinary well-being and subtle ordinary experiences, moments of feeling strong and peaceful, capable, moments of feeling grateful, uh, pleased, glad, moments of feeling connected with others, feeling loved and loving, the internalization of those moments is what actually is a primary source of the resilience that we can acquire over time. So the two can feed each other, as I said, in an upward spiral. So how does that actually work? Right? Mental resources are the fundamental basis of resilience. Right? So if lasting well-being comes uh, in large part from resilience, where does resilience come from? Well, resilience comes from a variety of mental resources. And I want to put this in a framework. 
This here is a fundamental model in healthcare and psychology. Sometimes it's called the stress diathesis model. It's the idea that the challenges that come at us pound on vulnerabilities. They form a diathesis with our vulnerabilities, which are offset by or compensated for, uh, protected by various resources. So if you want to make something better, so I'm a practical guy, you can intervene in any of these places. All are really important. Generally, though, I think resources often have the greatest opportunity. Uh, they're positive, it's forward-looking, and it's what we can build and grow. Very often, we can't really do anything about the challenges coming at us, and our vulnerabilities are often innate. We can't do much about them either. But resources have a lot of opportunity. OK, so where are resources located? Out in the world, healthcare systems, stop signs, um, neighbors who like you. Uh, Resources are also located in terms of the body, uh, strong immune system, uh, fitness, uh, you know, good metabolism, and resources are located in the mind, like mindfulness, gratitude, lovingness, and so forth. Well, all are important. Um, it's not either or. That said, I think growing resources in the mind has a special opportunity because we have great influence over the mind. And second, uh, growing resources in the mind has a, a special impact because we take the mind with us wherever you go. Remember the title of John Kabat-Zinn's initial sort of breakthrough book, Wherever You Go, There You Are, for better or worse, right? So I want to focus with you here now on the fundamental how, the neuropsychology of change, the neuropsychology of lasting, healing, development, growth, learning broadly defined to grow those resources in our mind. Some examples of resources, classic understandings. My own background's in developmental psychology, then clinical psychology. I've worked a ton in schools. I have a special feeling for children. My dissertation was on 15-month-olds. I have a lot of interest in that you know, foundational area. So some of these terms will be quite familiar. Secure attachment, executive functions, uh, clear understandings, wise view, right view, uh, insight into yourself and others. Uh, Well-being in general is a fundamental inner resource. Skills of various kinds, procedural learning of various kinds, and of course, positive emotions, uh, a fundamental sense of happiness. Happiness is a kind of inner muscle. So these are various mental resources. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, and I'd like to really emphasize a point here, uh, in part because I come from Marin County in California, the land of hot tubs and peacock feathers. And uh, it's really important to appreciate that this conversation about growing mental resources is, for me at least, very old school. It's the essence of self-reliance. It can be misunderstood and trivialized. And there's a kind of industry these days of, of professional Grinches who you know, poo-poo uh, research on happiness that, for example, uh, Kim was just talking about. But the truth is, the more a person's life sucks, the harder it is, the less that the world is uh, supporting them, uh, the, the less the, that the cavalry is coming, the more important it is for that person to look for those little opportunities in the flow of their difficult everyday life to grow various strengths inside. Okay. So this suggests uh, that most of our inner resources, most of uh, who we are, are actually acquired. And technically, uh, research on uh, the degree to which uh, a person's characteristics are heritable, baked into DNA, suggests that it's actually probably about a third, not about a half, in terms of the nature-nurture divide. The reason is that in identical twin studies that were the major basis for that 50% number, uh, twins are, uh, are, that are adopted into different environments, so identical twins separated at birth, adopted into different environments, those environments tend to be middle class or upper middle class environments because of the nature of adoption. And that meant that the impact of the environment, distinct from genetics, as well as the impact of internal mental figure, uh, factors was artificially restricted, which led to an overestimate of the impact of heritable factors. But when you really take a, uh, a very careful statistical look at that sort of stuff and you look at it over the life course, it suggests that on average about a third 
of a person's attributes, including their resilience, including their inner resources, inner strengths of various kinds, roughly about a third of the causes of what we have inside us in that area uh, are uh, embedded in our DNA. That leaves the other two thirds as in principle influenceable as a combination of our external situations, environments, how people treat us, the impact of structural forms of oppression, prejudice and discrimination, bad luck, good luck, and also in that two thirds are the things we do ourselves, in part to influence the world around us in a circular kind of way. So the takeaway point is that there's a lot we can do to develop ourselves and to help others develop themselves for the better over the life course, which means most fundamentally changing the brain for the better. <clears throat> so the practical question then becomes, how do you get those green balls into the brain? So this slide, uh, I'm not going to go through in numbing detail. I just wanted to list here a number of well-known mechanisms of what's called experience-dependent neuroplasticity, the ways in which uh, the brain is continually changing, the nervous system more broadly, and of course it's the brain and the nervous system embedded in the body altogether and in life and culture altogether. So uh, this is not, this is a pretty good summary of a number of mechanisms. There are a few others that I didn't have room for on my slide, but the takeaway point is, wow, there are a lot of ways that the hardware is designed to be changed by the experiences flowing through it. Uh, and one of many, many examples of this is in this slide, which was an early slide on the lasting impact of mindfulness meditation and from Sarah Lazar and her colleagues at Harvard. And the takeaway point here is that region number one is in the insula on the inside of the temporal lobes, a part of the brain that in long-term meditators compared to no meditating uh, is measurably thicker. So long-term meditators, and not perfect meditators, but reasonably diligent about it. I know some of the subjects in the study. Uh, they're pretty good, not perfect, but pretty good. Uh, they actually had measurably thicker tissue in the insula, which is a part of the brain that's involved in tuning into yourself. And actually, as well, you get a bonus benefit, one of the linkages between mindful practice, mindfulness practice, and social capacities, in that as you develop your own insula, by repeatedly tuning into yourself, you become more able to tune into the emotions of other people, become more empathic. So it's a nice connection there. A second major region that was measurably thicker in terms of the cortex, the outer skin or shell of the brain where most of the action is for information processing, region number two behind the forehead was also measurably thicker because long-term meditators compared to matched controls uh, repeatedly exercise that kind of muscle uh, they regulated their attention, top down, region number two, and kept themselves sitting on that zafu or cushion even if their knees started to hurt, all right? And they got a benefit there too. And then the third region, somatosensory cortex on the top of the head, kind of a bonus because you're tuning into your body again and again. As a detail, and I could talk about this slide for 10 minutes, I won't. If you look at this scatter plot on the bottom, Normally, we lose thousands of brain cells a day. They just die. Now, that sounds horrible, right? Uh, but you, you're born with about 1.1 trillion cells inside your brain, 10% of which, 100 billion or so, give or take, are neurons, right? So you lose a few thousand, maybe up to around 10,000 a day. That's a little offset by what's called neurogenesis, the birth of baby neurons, maybe 700 to 1,000 or so a day. But long term, there's a normal process of uh, loss of brain tissue. And in the cortex, it's called normal cortical thinning due to aging, which is associated with normal cognitive decline due to aging. Not dementia, not Alzheimer's, but as I often experience these days, walking into a room to do something. <sighs> Why did I come into this room? Then I need to go back to the previous room. Oh. I'm getting the thing out of the fat that my wife wants me to do. Yes, okay, good. Uh, and it's not because I'm resisting my wife's control, although <laughs> I should probably think about that somewhere. All right, point is, the red square people are the controls. They're the, they're the non-meditators. And you can see on this scatter plot that the thickness of their cortical sheet, 
was measurably thinner in these key regions in the older red square non-meditators compared to the younger red square non-meditators as well as the younger blue circle meditators. All right? But the older blue circle meditators did not have thinner tissue in those key regions. They used it so they did not lose it, which has lots of implications for everybody, including an aging population. And there are many, many other studies on humans and non-human animals that illustrate this broader point as well. Um, so how can we use the way the brain can change for the better from the inside out to steepen our healing curve, our growth curve, our learning curve, and that of other people over the lifespan. So this takes us into a very practical question. The uh, famous saying from the Canadian psychologist, Donald Hebb, O Canada, is that neurons that fire together together. That's the fundamental process. And from a pragmatic standpoint, uh, kind of mechanistically, the more we keep them firing, the more intensely they're firing, the more they're going to tend to wire together. This process occurs, and this is a critically important point. If I've got, of all my slides, there are like three that really, really matter. This is probably one of the three. Because people routinely forget the second stage. The first stage is you get the neurons firing. Call that encoding or activation, or people are having an experience, a state of being, a useful sensation, let's say of relaxation, a useful emotion, perhaps with useful thoughts like gratitude. Something good is happening. A good song is playing in the inner iPod, or I, I think inner jukebox, actually. That's good. But this is the relatively easy part. Most studies show that people, most people routinely are having many little moments for a handful of seconds at a time, many, many times a day, of mild positive emotion or some sense of something that's useful. And it's relatively easy to induce beneficial experiences in people, in children, in therapy clients, and uh, those we coach, those we work with. It's pretty straightforward to generate some kind of beneficial state of mind. But what gain is there from it? If there's no conversion to a lasting change in the nervous system, there's no lasting benefit. That's where the necessary second stage comes in, in the fundamental neuropsychology of change, of growth, of learning, of healing, of development. That um, encoding must move into consolidation in terms of lasting changes of neural structure or function. I talk about the movement from activation to installation, or more generally, from state to trait. So the question becomes, how do we really work that second stage? Which in my observation uh, repeatedly and you, is the forgotten stepchild. Uh, very often in clinical psychology, mindfulness training, and other forms of helping people heal and fulfill their human potential. So as examples, we become more compassionate by having experiences of compassion that we internalize. We become more grateful or mindful in the same way. We have experiences. You always start with experiencing what you got, want to grow, but then if you don't take it into yourself, if you don't help it land inside in some effective way, leaving a physical change behind in the body, well, it was momentarily pleasant, momentarily beneficial, but it had by definition no lasting value. Experiencing does not equal learning. Activation does not equal installation. And then for me, it's a haunting, poignant, and humbling question to ask myself, how many of the uh, hard-won beneficial experiences the clients had in my office, or momentarily at least our children had you know, while we were raising them, now they're 30 and 27, um, or what uh, fraction of the experiences that people are having in group environments, or that I'm doing myself, actually leave any lasting beneficial trace behind? It's really quite a haunting and humbling and important question. So the other thing that adds to the consequence of this is that, as Kim alluded to, um, in addition to the ways in which we often forget that second necessary stage and miss opportunities there, meanwhile, the brain is really, really good at turning momentary negative experiences into lasting change behind. 
I have the saying that we have a brain that evolved to be like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good ones. That's because as our ancestors evolved, uh, in a sense, they had to both get carrots, like food, mating opportunities, and so forth, and they had to avoid sticks, predators, natural hazards, and social sticks, social aggression. Uh, could be often lethal inside their band or between their bands. So both are important, but the difference is if you don't get a carrot today, you'll have a chance of one tomorrow. But if you fail to avoid that stick today, that saber-toothed tiger, that alpha male coming at you in your, in your primate band, kaboom, no more carrots forever. So we have a brain that routinely does five things. Scans for bad news, over-focuses upon it, over-reacts to it, fast tracks that package right into memory, especially, especially implicit memory, emotional memory, somatic memory, motivational, social, attitudinal memory. And then over time, the cortisol that travels with that negative experience um, goes up into the brain and sensitizes the brain's alarm bell, its amygdala, and weakens and even kills neurons in a nearby part of the brain, the hippocampus, that puts things in context inhibits the amygdala, and the hippocampus also tells the hypothalamus, quit calling for stress hormones. Sounds complicated, but the bottom line is it becomes a vicious cycle. Stressful, upsetting, irritating experiences today, including mild ones, being exasperated, being self-critical, feeling hurt, being anxious, uh, getting uh, annoyed, uh, and more intense experiences from that, than that, those experiences today impact us and make us a little more vulnerable to negative experiences tomorrow, so they hit us a little bit harder, which makes us even more vulnerable to the day after that. And then also, number six, ends up creating vicious cycles with other people. We have a brain that is optimized for peak performance in Stone Age conditions. And sometimes today, if a person is working in a battlefield or growing up in what feels like a war zone, Okay, there's a place for the negativity bias, but on the whole today, it creates much needless suffering, much needless conflict with other people, and it functions as a kind of bottleneck in the brain. The negativity bias is sort of like a well-intended universal learning disability that's designed to help us operate at our best in Stone Age conditions. So, how do we do it? How do you grow that unshakable core? The fundamental process of change in learning, uh, I did not invent. Uh, I am focused on the internal factors, what, things we can do inside our minds to be, to borrow the phrase, truly active learners uh, about the social emotional learning that is most consequential, generally speaking, for ourselves and for other people. But this HEAL framework is a nice organizing framework because I have a lot of detail about it that's freely offered at my website. You can learn a lot more. You're very welcome to just take and use and just apply however you like, whatever's there. No licensing fees necessary. You don't even have to credit me. It's really OK. Just take it and use it um, and uh, all the rest of that. The fundamental framework for me is first in the, of the two stages of learning, have a beneficial experience. Get that song playing in your mind. Briefly, typically. Uh, mildly, typically, always authentically. Never about resisting pain, which just creates more pain. So have a beneficial experience. And then in the installation phase, two fundamental aspects. Enrich the experience to help it be big, uh, intense, and lasting. And absorb it. Get a sense of it sinking in, becoming a part of yourself, and uh, tuning into what's rewarding about it which will do various things in the hippocampus involving dopamine and norepinephrine uh, that will flag the experiences that are rewarding or meaningful as keepers for protection in lasting storage. That's the essence of the process of learning. Have it, enjoy it. That's the fundamental essence. And then if you want, the optional step, the link step, um, is to be aware of both positive and negative material at the same time. For example, having a large experience uh, that people are friendly and they, they like you and they include you, let's say here, while deliberately off to the side, are those old feelings maybe of being left out, 
uh, in middle school uh, or rejected or let down or not really attuned to while you were growing up. I had a lot of those kind of experiences. And so because neurons that fire together wire together, in the linking step, if you keep the positive experience prominent in the foreground of awareness for a breath or two or three, it will gradually associate with, soothe, heal, and even replace over time that negative material. All right, that's the fundamental summary. Boiled down to four words, have it, and then enjoy it. For a breath or two or three in a row, stay with it, feel it in the body, track what's rewarding about it. That will turbocharge the conversion process of that state to trait. Any single time you do this probably won't change your life, but the gradual accumulation, as the Buddha said in the beginning, uh, drop by drop, bit by bit, you can really fill yourself up over time. There are a variety of benefits for doing this deliberately in terms of growing specific resources inside. Uh, also, there are benefits that are implicit in the sense that built into this practice, you need to be on your own side. There's a quality of caring and interest. It is a mindfulness practice, so it's a kind of mindfulness training in the process of taking in the good, internalization, and probably you can gradually sensitize your brain for the better, not just uh, letting cortisol sensitize it to the negative, but you can sensitize it to the positive. So gradually over time, the brain becomes more and more like Velcro for the good and Teflon for the bad. And as Lao Tzu said it much more eloquently than I can a long time ago, keep a green bough in your heart and a singing bird will come. So then I want to apply this general stuff to a fundamental topic of growing key strengths. And I'm going to use an evolutionary model of the brain as an organizing framework here. So this is the familiar so-called triune brain model. It's an oversimplification, but it's a useful fiction. Uh, basically, we have a brain that evolved, that developed like building a house with three floors from the bottom up. The first floor of the house of the brain is the brain stem associated with the reptilian stage of evolution. The nervous system is in, has been evolving for about 600 million years. In the larger context of life evolving, another three billion years before that. So we have the more or less reptilian brainstem. Then we have the subcortex associated with the mammalian stage of evolution beginning around 200 million years ago, the second floor of the house of the brain. And then on top of that, we have the neocortex or cortex uh, associated with the primate and especially human stage of evolution. The brain has roughly tripled in volume in the last several million years since our ancestors began manufacturing tools, using tools to make tools. And a large fraction, by the way, of that tripling of volume of the brain is dedicated to love, broadly defined. This is the social brain theory. This is the notion that our social capabilities really aided our evolution. Uh, and we, in effect, have been shaped profoundly by um, the benefits of love, broadly defined, you know, for our ancestors. OK, so in terms of that framework of the brain, we have a linkage between the three-stage evolution of the brain and our three fundamental needs. Basically, and this is a familiar idea in psychology as a fundamental framework, we need to be safe. We need to be satisfied, broadly defined, including fed. And we need to be connected, especially as the most social species on the planet. Those uh, needs are achieved through avoiding harms for safety, approaching rewards for satisfaction, attaching to others for connection. And those stages of, uh, pardon me, the, the, the evolution of those ways of meeting our needs are very linked to the three-stage evolution of the brain. So our safety needs are particularly associated with the reptilian brainstem. The management of satisfaction needs, especially related to the mammalian subcortex, and the management uh, and fulfillment and regulation of our social needs, very much related to the uh, primate and especially human neocortex. This is a framework. All right. This goes to, if you have any interest in this, um, a fundamental idea about why do we suffer and how can we be functional in this world without being afflicted by the poisons, if you will, 
of greed, hatred, heartache, and delusion. People commonly experience an underlying sense of deficit or disturbance in the meeting of their needs. Uh, you may know that in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the five needs, the first four are called D needs, D for deficit needs. There's an underlying sense of, of a not enoughness, something missing, something wrong, deficit and disturbance. That tips us naturally enough into a drive state, into various drive states, which the Buddha 2,500 years ago referred to very broadly as craving. Uh, that word is a translation of, of a word in the language of early Buddhism of, that really means thirst. We're thirsty because we're missing something. All right? This is our natural machinery. It's poignant to appreciate that we evolved to crave and suffer because it increased the odds of survival and living to see the sunrise and eating lunch today, not being lunch today. So this is a natural process, and yet it's, the, it's a central, perhaps the fundamental neuropsychological, neurobiological uh, engine of suffering and harm. What this means is if we crave, broadly defined, if we fight what's unpleasant, if we chase and grasp for what's pleasant, if we cling to what's heartfelt, if we just ignore and move on from what's neutral, if that is driven at bottom by an underlying sense of deficit and disturbance, which it is, then that takes us in the direction of a solution. Because if we repeatedly internalize again and again and hardwire them into ourselves, experiences of needs met, sufficiency of needs met, not perfect, not million dollar moments, not the best day of your life, but the ordinary opportunities to experience a certain amount of peacefulness uh, uh, for, for safety, a certain amount of, or an enoughness of satisfaction and an enoughness of connection, what that means is we can then grow over time that unshakable core that we carry with us so we can meet the next moment feeling already full, already contented, already at peace, already loved and loving. And that's a profound opportunity. To summarize that from a practical sense, and I've got three images here in a moment, uh, we can move through our day for a breath here and a breath there multiple, multiple times a day in uh, looking for opportunities to experience safety, satisfaction, and connection. In other words, looking for opportunities to repeatedly pet the lizard. And then we need to also feed the mouse, right? Feed the mouse, look for those little opportunities to experience completion of a task, you know, finishing an email and registering it before racing on to the next thing. And of course, many opportunities a day to hug the monkey, to feel received by other people, included, not a best friend moment necessarily, but friendliness. Uh, the root of the word for loving kindness in the ancient languages is friendship. It's friendliness. Loving kindness sounds fancy, but friendliness I can relate to. And as I move toward an end here, and I will preserve a, a minute or two for practice at the very end, um, this matter that I'm raising has enormous personal implications. It's very hopeful. It means that there are many opportunities a day to grow the uh, factors of that unshakable core of resilient well-being hardwired into our body. We have many opportunities a day, bit by bit, drop by drop. That's hopeful. It also, boom, takes us to responsibility because no one can do that practice but us. Only we can really help ourselves grow from the experiences that we're having. Also, <coughs> excuse me, there are wider implications. This has a lot of political implications here because we're very vulnerable as humans to these ancient manipulations of fear, greed, and us against them conflict. As people in, who are citizens uh, and then scaled up to groups, communities, uh, larger political units, countries, and even the whole wide world, as people grow this unshakable core inside themselves, they become harder and harder to manipulate in those ancient ways, which has big, big, big implications for our whole wide world. So to finish, I hope you will practice with me for a minute here. You want to do a little internal practice? And then we'll segue into a break and I'll hang out and chat with you if you like. OK? So with your eyes open or closed, the point here <coughs> is um, to gently 
open to or encourage and be mindful of what it might feel like to feel all right enough as you meet the next moment in the core of your being. Around its periphery could be physical pain, could be worry, could be stress. That's fine. That's normal. But in your ground of being, in your innermost core, the temple inside the temple inside the temple in your heart, can you find there some sense of enoughness and all rightness? So I'll gently uh, suggest a few things to be aware of, and then we'll finish up here. All right? So to begin in terms of safety, can you help yourself let go of being mindful of and letting go of unnecessary anxiety? Noticing any uneasiness or guarding or bracing or worry. Just letting it go. And in its place, opening to, encouraging and receiving, a sense of calm strength. You're all right right now, and now the mind increasingly at peace. You can also be aware of a possibility of a growing contentment. It would be nice to have more and an awareness of gratitude or gladness for so much of what you have already. And you can feel a falling away of unnecessary frustration or drivenness. as you meet the next moment with a sense of enoughness already, contented already. And then if you like, you can rest as well and take into yourself a sense of connection, a sufficiency of connectedness, which has a receiving aspect. It's fine to actively remember people who care about you, even if they drive you crazy some days, feeling loved, included, perhaps groups of people, perhaps your dog or your cat. And also being aware of the expressive aspect of, of connection, your own compassion, kindness, good heart for others. Resting here as well in an enoughness of connection, loved and loving. And then in the final minute, simply exploring. What is it like to abide now and now with a minimal or no sense of craving, a sense of resting in a fundamental well-being? And sensing this well-being sinking into you, spreading out inside you, establishing itself in you. If you like, you can open your eyes as we finish here while continuing this practice. 
and observing that you can have resilient well-being as the kind of wallpaper of your mind as you face or deal with challenges and engage the next moment, including segueing here to our break. So thank you very much. It's a wrap. Thank you.